that looked at the path forward in terms of how to proceed with our new prevention strategies. Next to uh, Professor Rees is Professor Sitambiso Velapi, who is the head of pediatrics at Baraguanath Hospital and uh, a professor at uh, Wits University, followed by Dr. Uh, Mo Archery from the University of KwaZulu Natal. Oh, Professor oh, Velapi and Dr. Oh, Archery oh, led the technical oh, working group in the Ministerial Advisory Committee to look at the issue of uh, children, because both are pediatricians, looking at the issue of what is it going to take for us to uh, uh, have children go back to school in relative safety. And then finally, Professor Jessine Meyer-Rath, who is from the University of Witwatersrand, and she is uh, the person who is one of the leaders of the technical working group in the Ministerial Advisory Committee, looking at how we should best use our available resources in, uh, in the COVID-19 tests that we have available. So it's uh, my pleasure to have uh, members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee available uh, and in, in joining us in this call. What I propose to do in the next 15 to 20 minutes is I'd like to share with you uh, an, an overview of what are we trying to achieve. And I find that it's always helpful to have a clear perspective about ensuring that we keep our eye on the prize and what is that that we're trying to achieve. I'll talk about the coronavirus prevention toolbox and I'll talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in the COVID-19 epidemic before I end off with touching on the issue of the hotspots and this particular stage of the response before making some concluding remarks. So the primary objective, the primary goal of the South African COVID-19 response is flattening the curve. And what do we mean by flattening the curve? Well, essentially, we are trying to avoid a rapid increase in new infections to the point where it would overwhelm our healthcare services. So if we look at what flattening the curve means, well, it's really a strategy that we are taking forward and it's a strategy pretty much being followed uh, in almost every country in the world is in the absence of natural immunity or a vaccine, almost everyone may be at risk of the coronavirus infection. And so there will come a time when the infection has an opportunity to take root. And when that happens, we will see increasing numbers that may need hospital care. So the reason for flattening the curve is to reduce the rate of new infections so that the peak is lowered to a level where hospitals can cope with the cases. So flattening the curve reduces the peak during the massive surge, so it does not overwhelm healthcare provisions. And we know that hospitals that can cope with the patients coming in have, can provide better care and lead to fewer deaths. So let's look at what strategy in particular we embarked on as a country? Well, we embarked on a strategy to flatten the curve early. And we were able to do so because we were able to learn from the experiences of others. And that we learned that those countries that attempted to flatten the curve when the epidemics were at an advanced state had had difficulty in achieving the goal of flattening. So we learned, especially from the experiences in the UK, that if you delay, and in the UK, they, they instituted uh, a lockdown about a month or so after South Africa, that when you delay and you've got a very advanced <laughs> epidemic, then you really have a challenge in flattening the curve. So we learned that early was better. And so we were fortunate in that we undertook these initiatives at a very early stage. So why did we attempt to flatten the curve early? Well, we tried to do that. We did that to try and achieve 
four things. First is that we were trying to slow community. Goal. The first reason why we were trying to flatten the curve early was to slow community transmission. We wanted to avoid a situation where the virus became widespread in our community and was being transmitted. The second is that we wanted to get some time. And that time was to give us the opportunity to expand healthcare capacity, especially ICU and high level care. And if you look at the picture on the right hand side, you, it's unrecognizable that that is actually the Cape Town International Convention Center that is now being established as a field hospital. The third was to provide time so that we could better prepare and equip our hospitals, ensure that we obtained the necessary PPE and provided the opportunity for healthcare workers to get ready for the surge of cases that may be coming. And then fourthly, was to provide time to scale up our testing and our prevention strategies. And in this particular instance, our approach of instituting a huge community program where we've screened just about 13 million people. So we aim to flatten the curve early to achieve these four things. So why do we talk about flattening the curve? Why not talk about eradicating or eliminating this virus? Why don't we aim for a situation where we, we just get rid of this virus? Well, the reality is that it's very difficult to do so. It is very difficult to stop the spread of this virus. And the reason for that really revolves around these five characteristics. The first is that even before a person becomes ill with the coronavirus infection, for several days before they have symptoms, they are already infectious and they are already spreading the virus to others. And so household contacts become infected. Uh, people they interact with in public transport in a range of different settings can get the, the virus from somebody who hasn't yet shown symptoms. The second is that we have, and we think, because we haven't been able to measure this accurately in many parts of the world, including South Africa, but we think that somewhere between 20% and 50% of infections are very mild. So we call these asymptomatic uh, infections, where the person does not know at all that they've acquired this particular virus. But even though they do not have symptoms, they are still infectious and they can spread this virus. The third is that this virus spreads rapidly, much more rapidly than we've seen with other infections, such as influenza. And so before we can even catch up, we're trying to find the cases, the virus has already spread. And that we know that it can infect from each infected person can infect up to two others. The, the fuck uh, reason why it's so difficult is because this particular virus is also associated with super spreading events. We saw this in particular in the one case in South Korea, where the first 30 patients, they were able to control the amount of spread by identifying all those who were in contact with the person by doing contact tracing. They were able to put in quarantine and they stopped the spread of the virus. However, patient 31 in South Korea was infected. She went to church. She then went to a buffet lunch. She then went to the hospital where she had a test. And when she had done these things, she had exposed thousands of people. There were hundreds that became infected through the buffet lunch. So you get these super spreading events. And because so many people get infected, it's really difficult to find every one of those cases and to stop the infection from spreading. And then finally, even when you do get the spread under control, because we do not have adequate immunity, you will always 
run the risk of repeated waves of outbreaks and the new epidemics coming. For example, Singapore, which for many days had the epidemic under control, with very few and almost no uh, indigenous uh, infections occurring. And then suddenly they have an outbreak, several hundred cases occurring in, the, in one particular residential complex for migrant workers. So it is very difficult for us to simply eliminate this virus. And so we have chosen an alternative, which is to flatten the curve. So how do we do that? Well, most countries in the world have chosen to go with a strategy that was first implemented in China, known as a lockdown. We've in the process of a lockdown, we are now in the easing of the lockdown. So we know all of the challenges that that is associated with, but we also need to get some understanding of what did it achieve? Well, let's have some idea of what happened. In the three weeks from the time we had the first case to the date of the lockdown, the epidemic was growing at a rate, and we use, I've used for this purposes of this presentation, something called doubling time. So how long does it take before the number of cases doubles? In other words, the size of the epidemic doubles. Well, in the three weeks before the lockdown, the epidemic was doubling every two days. And indeed, if it continued along a trajectory like that, we would have had an epidemic that would, we would have been very similar to what you see in the UK, which is tens of thousands of deaths and uh, hundreds of thousands of infections. But since the, we instituted the lockdown, and over the period of the lockdown, the doubling time diminished drastically from two days to 15 days. So now the epidemic is only doubling roughly once every two weeks. So we went from doubling. Can we mute, can we mute this line, please? Prof, can you unmute yourself, please? So we went to a situation. Where the epidemic was doubling every two weeks. Since we started easing the lockdown on the 1st of May, that doubling time is starting to slowly quicken. We are now at a doubling time of around 12 days. If you look at the situation that we have been trying to uh, deal with, is now we are trying to implement the full coronavirus prevention toolbox. One of those tools is the lockdown, and that's what we have implemented, and now we are in the process of easing that. But it has come a time now because uh, we need to be using much, many more of our tools. We need to understand what they are. And I've provided this picture to give you uh, some idea of the spectrum of tools that we have. And looking at these tools, can you hear me? Okay. So if you look at the spectrum of these tools, what it tells us is that we need in each setting. So if we are talking about a mine, if we are talking about public transport, if we are talking about a shopping center, in each of those situations, we need to understand what the risks are. And once we've identified what those risks are, we need to choose the correct tools for it. So that if we are dealing, for example, with a problem of trying to, let's for example say, trying to remove a screw, we wouldn't go around trying to use a hammer Instead, we'd use a screwdriver. So we've got to pick the correct tools to solve the particular problem that we are dealing with. 
And that's why this toolbox is important, that we pick from the toolbox a combination of things that will mitigate the risk and enable us to go about trying to capture as much of our daily lives as is possible without raising our risks unnecessarily. One of the issues which is causing great consternation is a, 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 a tool that's being used which is not in the toolbox. And that's the process of human disinfection. And they are particularly being used in tunnels. This should simply not be permitted. Spraying of humans with chemicals and putting humans through fumigation tunnels is potentially dangerous. It can damage the eyes, it can cause skin rashes, it can affect breathing. There is little or no evidence for the safety of the chemicals that are being used. And their side effects are largely unknown. There's, and to cap it all, it's not just that these are potentially harmful. It's that there's no discernible benefit for coronavirus prevention. The virus simply does not enter the body through intact skin. The, the coronavirus, when it does cause infection, enters through the mouth, the nose, the eyes. The spraying does not help in any one of those conditions. So what we have in these uh, fumigation tunnels and human spraying is a harmful practice that has almost no benefit. So what should you be doing instead? Or well, focus on the toolbox. And one of the key things to do is to spray your hands with a hand sanitizer so that any virus that may have been picked up from surfaces can be killed. I cannot stress enough the importance of not going through one of these fumigation tunnels. So let's look at one of the strategies that's a key part of our toolbox, and that's scaling up testing. In South Africa, we have made very good progress in terms of scaling up testing. But with that progress has come many challenges. One of the key challenges is that we as a country, together with the rest of the world, are all trying to get hold of the same test kits. And that becomes a challenge, that we are having a real problem in ensuring that we can obtain enough of these test kits. And right now, one of our particular challenges is to obtain enough of the extraction kits. And so we've had to prioritize our testing. We've prioritized it to hospital patients, healthcare workers, and outbreaks. And if you look at the way in which we have been increasing our testing, it's simply a matter of, of time before we were going to reach a situation where we would have difficulty obtaining new kits. And that has now occurred. And there are many repercussions from that that you will hear from Dr. Chetty later on this, this evening. So one of the issues that's important for me to uh, comment on, because I had proposed previously that we look at the number of cases per day and use the confidence interval of 45 to 89 as a way of judging whether the number of cases was going up or down. But that approach is only applicable when the number of tests are not changing substantially. And But you can see very obviously from the orange bars that because the numbers of tests have been increasing so dramatically, it is no longer feasible to look at a simply the absolute number of tests. So we have to come up with better metrics, better ways of understanding what's the situation in the epidemic. And it's illustrated when you look at the first week of the lockdown. So in the lockdown period, during that first week when the lockdown started, the number of cases declined from 111 to 76. But at the same time, the average daily number of tests went from 
2,234 to 3,928. So the number of tests was going up, but the number of cases was going down. Compare that to the situation in the first week after the easing of the lockdown occurred, where the number of cases went up from 242, and that's the uh, number of cases, the daily average, to a situation where we have 369. But that is accompanied by a dramatic increase in the number of tests from 12,000 on to just over 15,000. So you cannot simply look at the number of cases any longer. That was only feasible very early on in the epidemic. So what is it that we should look at at this time? Well, there are many different measures. We look at in in the Ministerial Advisory Committee and among epidemiologists, we look at a range of different measures. We call them the reproduction number. We call it the effective reproduction number. We look at doubling time. Well, there are many things. The WHO recommends several of these measures. But one of the things that's proven to be very useful and it's widely used in many countries, including the US, is what proportion of the tests that are being performed are positive. And I'll refer to this as the positive test proportion. So if you look at this graph, it provides for each week since the start of the coronavirus epidemic, it provides the total number of tests that we did in each week. So the first week in the, in the epidemic, we did 443 tests. The following week, 723. The following week, 1,998, and so on. And so that's listed with the N. If you look at the most recent week, which is not a complete week yet, we've uh, performed 39,170 tests. So what we need to look at is what proportion of those tests are positive. And you can see that since the initiation of the lockdown, we have had our positive test proportion has been steadily declining, and it's remained within this narrow range between 1% and 3%. And it's giving you some idea, about 3.4%, it's giving you some idea that overall in the, in the rest of the country, because this excludes the Western Cape, that in the rest of the country, besides the Western Cape, the overall level of positivity is low. And it indicates to us that the level of community transmission by extrapolation is low. And we can divide these samples into different strata. So if we look at hospital patients only, the, the percentages don't go up that much. If we look at only our community screening, the percentages go a little lower. But overall, it doesn't matter which group you look at, the percentages remain low. Compare that, remember that this is the other eight provinces, compare that with the Western Cape. And what you see is a dramatically different picture. In the Western Cape, you can see how week by week, the number of tests have been going up. So if you look at, you know, four or five weeks ago, they were doing about 10,000 tests that week, went up to 12,000 tests, 13,000 tests, almost 15,000 tests. And so as you look at the increasing number of tests, what you see is that not only are the tests increasing, but the proportion of tests that are positive is also increasing. And if you divide that into hospital patients and community or contacts or outbreak investigations, you see that these increases are mirrored in both situations. So this tells us that we have a different scenario in the Western Cape compared to the rest of the country. And in this graph, I've put the same two uh, sets of bars together so you can see the comparison that in the Western Cape, we are dealing with an epidemic that is growing rapidly. In the rest of the country, we are dealing with an epidemic that is at a low simmering level. 
what is the situation? Why are we seeing this picture in the Western Cape? Well, we can look at it across a range of indicators. That when you look at the Western Cape, that you see that not only is the number of cases high and the incidence risk is high, but they account for just around two thirds of all our cases. And they account for about two thirds of all the cases. And that is reflected in the continuity between having cases, having hospital admissions, and having deaths. It would be unusual, if not impossible, to have a situation where you would have a dramatic number of cases that you simply don't know about because it would manifest either in hospitalizations or in deaths. So we can see that the picture in the Western Cape is substantially different from the remaining provinces. There's another way of looking at that. If you look at the incidence risk, you can see that all of the provinces are at the bottom end of this graph. But the line that's rapidly rising is that of the Western Cape. So what is responsible for this increase? Or how can we measure this increase before I talk about what's responsible? We can measure it in many different ways. I've chosen to use doubling time. And if you look at the doubling time in the Western Cape, you can see that we went from a doubling time during the lockdown of 18 days to a situation now where in the Western Cape it's doubling every nine days. When the epidemic gets into its full swing, generally the doubling time is around four to five days. Now, you have to be somewhat circumspect at looking at these data because you do need to have adequate numbers of tests being done in order to be able to get a very accurate measure. So this, in the interpretation of these numbers, always has to be tempered with an understanding of the limitations of these data in that we simply do not have enough tests and that we have backlogs in terms of being able to obtain the accurate numbers on a daily basis. Compare the nine days doubling time in the Western Cape to Gauteng, where the doubling time is 24 days, or KwaZulu-Natal, where it is 26 days, or the Eastern Cape, where it is 12 days. So if we look at this situation, we again are getting a sense that the Western Cape has a very different picture. If you look at what is driving this? These are hotspot maps that come from the Western Cape, and I'm deeply grateful to the Western Cape Department of Health for providing these. They give you some idea of what the actual distribution is. And in the Western Cape, what occurred was in the latter part of the lockdown, the strict level five lockdown, we saw outbreaks occurring. Most of them occurred in grocery stores and supermarkets. And when you have those kinds of outbreaks, they very rapidly lead to a situation mm -hmm. where customers uh, lead to infecting staff or staff get infected in the community and come into the store. They contaminate the store. It spread to other staff, spreads to customers. And before you know it, you now have widespread transmission. But what's important is that in the Western Cape, they've been able to identify these hotspots. They have been able to identify the sources of these uh, transmissions. And it's very likely that in many of these hotspots, they were associated with super spreading events. We don't have definitive evidence of that, but it's suggestive that it was a company, these outbreaks were accompanied with super spreading events. And the Western Cape has developed a very specific hotspot strategy that's focusing on dealing with this problem at a very local level. Because we've got to try and slow the number of cases in order to ensure that we are able to cope. And so when we look at our response, when I first described our response in its eight stages several weeks ago, I said that we were completing the first four stages and we are now at the tail end of stage four and we are about to end 
active case finding from community uh, screening. And we are now in full swing working on stage five, which is hotspots, where we are trying to identify those particular points at which the epidemic is going to take off. I described it in my previous presentation as we have to look for the flames and we have to douse them before they become raging fires. And so that means we have to have surveillance, it means we need to be able to identify where these hotspots occurs, which means we have to be able to test. We have to intervene. We have to understand why the virus is spreading. And we need to have outbreak investigations and try and turn off the tap. We've got to try and find the reason for the spread and stop that from occurring again. And so we knew that as the lockdown comes to an end, that we should expect a rise in cases and we should expect outbreaks. We are already seeing those outbreaks, whether it's in the Albany Bakery or whether it's in Joburg's Medi Clinic or whether it's in a discam store or in the prisons, we will see outbreaks. Just this, this last few days, we saw an outbreak in one of the mines. This is how the virus spreads. It is not a reason to panic. It is not a reason to shut everything down. It is simply the basis on which we have to go in, establish who has the, picked up the virus, establish what the size of the flame is, establish why it occurred, and then figure out what are the intervention steps to stop it from spreading any further. It's a systematic approach to dealing with outbreaks. So let me conclude uh, by just pointing out one last uh, element, and that is that when we look at how our epidemic curve compares with others, that there is little question that our epidemic curve, if it followed the inflection point and continued on its exponential growth, we would have seen a curve with something like what we see in the United Kingdom, which has a similar population size to South Africa. Instead, our curve has been flattened. You can see the way in which the light blue line is now at a much lower level than the purple United Kingdom line. But it's not that only. South Africa's line is among those epidemics that are the least uh, severe of all of the epidemics. We are, we are keeping company with South Korea, Australia, and so on. However, if we do not ensure that we continue using our prevention toolbox, that line could very easily rise rapidly and join the lines that we see in the UK and in the US. So that brings me to my concluding remarks, that South Africa has averted the exponential curve we anticipated and that we were expecting to see in March. We have flattened the curve insofar as we have started to flatten the curve because flattening the curve is not a single event. We are going to need to continue our efforts and we're going to have to continue this for months, years, and just depending on when and if we can obtain a vaccine. The time that we have been able to acquire through our interventions to date, through the state of disaster, through the lockdown, through the implementation of social distancing, hand washing and so on, has given us time to improve testing, to build healthcare capacity, to establish field capabilities for healthcare, PPE procurement, but there is lots more still to be done. Testing coverage was improving, but has run into serious supply problems. Mitigating risk as we return to work by using combinations of tools from our prevention toolbox is going to have to be part of our new normal. In essence, there's simply no room for complacency. We expect the case numbers will rise. Depending on what the migration patterns are from the Western Cape, we may see a continual seeding of the epidemic from the Western Cape into the Eastern Cape. And that may be 
the next point at which we will see an outbreak occurring. We are expecting outbreaks. We are expecting to see these flames. The Western Cape is simply an early indication of what we may see in the rest of the country. I sincerely hope that as we watch and as we learn from the experience of the Western Cape, we may be able to avert some of the, the, the rapid growth in the epidemic that we have seen in the Western Cape. Indeed, we are learning a lot from the experiences in the Western Cape as we focus on stage five, on identifying hotspots and intervening and essentially finding the flames so that we can prevent raging fires. It just remains for me to thank all of the people who've contributed data to this presentation and to all the hardworking people tackling the coronavirus epidemic, especially our healthcare workers on the front line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Professor Abdul Karim, for that very enlightening presentation. Would like to call onto the stage now Dr. Kemi Chetty to table a brief presentation on the testing uh, within the National Health Laboratory Services. Dr. Kemi Chetty, please come uh, uh, on stage with your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Minister. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Minister. I'm going to focus on the uh, unprocessed specimens uh, of COVID-19 testing uh, in the, the, uh, the NHLS. Um, as at 28th of May, the, the, the number of unprocessed specimens was about 83,000. Um, and uh, as indicated, it was just, uh, despite a massive increase in the number of tests that we were performing in, in the NHLS. Uh, as you can see from the table at the bottom, our figures have more than doubled between April and May. Um, so you can see that in March, we did about uh, 6,000 tests. In April, there was a, a huge jump. We went to 94,000. And in May alone, we've, we've done about 232,000 tests. But despite that, the, uh, the number of, of samples that we were receiving exceeded the capacity that, that we had. And, and that's why we uh, ended up with the uh, a, a number of tests that are unprocessed. And also just to give you an example of how we are uh, trying to uh, escalate the number of tests that we are doing. During this week, just between Monday and Thursday, that's about uh, four days, we've already done about 39,000 tests. That represents about 42% of what was done in April alone. Um, just to give an idea of uh, uh, the reason as to the unprocessed specimens in May, the, the problem really started in the first week in May when uh, the demand exceeded supply. And that was due to a global shortage of the extraction and high throughput kits. And I'll talk a bit around the high throughput kits. We also, the month of, of uh, May was uh, a really problematic month with uh, a number of logistical issues. Uh, some of our suppliers had interruptions with production. Uh, their, their factories had to, to close down uh, when, when patients test, uh, uh, tested positive. There were lots of fi flight cancellations from a number of different countries. Uh, we had problems with custom delays. We also had lots of problems with closure of services uh, during the public holidays. Um, one, one of the other issues that we also had to deal with is that it's not a normal uh, demand and, and supply uh, issue. When we, we normally order tests, we determine the number of tests that we want. We place an order to the supplier and the supplier gives us those tests. Uh, but the, we, we had a problem with the high throughput test kits, um, which the, the, had only been approved in March uh, by the FDA. And uh, we, we had, a, uh, and 
because of that, there was a production issue. Um, so, so we couldn't, even though we were ordering the number of tests that we wanted to do per day, uh, that uh, we, we weren't getting those supplies. Uh, with the high throughput uh, test kits as well, the supplier decides as to what's the allocation for the different continents. And then uh, that supply for the continent is then divided uh, by the, uh, between the different countries. Um, and this is because of the, the challenges that the suppliers are experiencing in production. Um, the suppliers have indicated that uh, uh, this is the allocation that we would get. Uh, so regardless of what we've ordered, uh, we get what the supplier can give. And uh, we've been told a number of times that South Africa is in a more fortunate position than many other countries because the, uh, the, the amount that we're getting is a larger proportion, even though for us, the amount that we're getting is, is, is very small. So just to give you an example, uh, the gene expert, uh, it's a machine that we use uh, to, uh, to do TB tests. We're also now using it for, for COVID-19. It's got the capacity to do about 15,000 tests per day. Uh, that's what the, 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 all the gene experts we've got in the NHLS. Uh, but what we get allocated is 10,000 tests per week. Now that's just to give an example uh, of some of the difficulties that we're having with regard to supply. Um, this table shows you what has been the unprocessed specimens in, in May. Um, and uh, these numbers uh, fluctuate. Uh, you know, I often don't like putting these figures up because uh, someone will say, no, but those numbers are not correct. But just to give you an idea that as we are processing tests, you can see uh, there's uh, reductions, but at the same time, we also are receiving tests. Uh, but this is a fair reflection of the backlog that uh, the unprocessed specimens that we've had in May. Uh, so as of the 28th, uh, we had about uh, 83,000 uh, tests that were uh, not processed. Uh, this table, Minister, I won't go through the details of it. I think Prof. Abdul Karim has, uh, has covered quite a bit. This gives you the breakdown of the number of tests that have been done in the different po uh, provinces for both the public and the private sector. Uh, the proportion of tests, he's commented, uh, and, and, and you have commented that Gauteng has got the highest proportion of tests. Uh, that's followed by the Western Cape and then the Eastern Cape. Uh, yet Western Cape has got the highest number of positive uh, uh, patients. Uh, but this table also shows the, the number of the unallocated, uh, the backlog of the unallocated uh, tests. These are tests that have already been processed, uh, but as explained by yourself, they, the, uh, these are the tests that uh, th there's not enough data and that uh, the NICD then, uh, and I'm sure the NICD will, will talk to this, uh, then looks at uh, being able to allocate these tests to a particular category. Uh, and and uh, it also comprises some of the, uh, the, the, the foreign nationals. So uh, just to give you an idea then of what's the basic lab processes and the types of machines that we've got, and I'm not gonna go into too much of, of detail, um, but just to give you an indication that the, the whole process of, of doing the tests uh, is dependent on the type of machine that you've got, uh, but it is quite a complex uh, process. Uh, we start off with the preparation of the sample, and then we, we, we have uh, the extraction of the, the RNA from the virus, uh, and we, we have what's called reverse transcription of, of the DNA. Uh, and that's done by uh, extraction machines. And then we have the, the, the thermocycling uh, cycling machines, which then look at the amplification of, of the DNA. Uh, it's just, this is just to illustrate that with certain of the machines, there's, uh, you need a separate extractor. So for, for example, we've got extractors called the Nimbus and the EasyMag. Uh, and then you take the, the sample from that and you put it into the, uh, the thermocyclers um, and uh, that process in itself uh, means that you have these machines are not high throughput machines. Uh, 
Uh, so, so the amount of samples that you get from it may not be uh, similar to what we would get with what we call the high throughput machines. And that's the, the second category of the, 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 uh, the Roche Cobus machine and the Gene Expert, which are really our workhorses. And that's why we are saying that these, these are the machines that, uh, and the test kits that we, we desperately uh, need more of. Um, so so we, uh, we've got the, in addition to the, the Gene Expert and the Cobus, we've also got another machine called the, the Abbott uh, M2000. But because of some of the difficulties that we have, we, we, we are now looking at diversifying and we've bought uh, a number of other machines and I'll talk a bit around that as part of our risk mitigation strategy. Um, um, this slide then shows uh, that uh, what, what is our testing capacity? And when we talk about our testing capacity, we're talking of what's the throughput that the machines can do. So what's the capacity of the machine to do the test if we have a full complement of the test kits uh, and, and the extraction kits? So with our BIRAD machines, we can do about 5,000 tests in, in 24 hours. And then uh, with the, the Roche Cobus and the Gene Experts, we can do about 15,000 tests in 24 hours. So immediately you can see where the problem lies because if we don't have enough test kits for the, the high throughput machines, that's already eating into to the, the, uh, our capacity or not utilizing the capacity to its fullest extent. Uh, regardless of that, you'll also see that we've been trying to uh, to, to push uh, as much of the tests that, that we can. Um, this gives you an idea then of the, the, the number of test kits that we've got. Uh, that's the PCR test kits. We've broken it down into the, the open platforms and you can immediately see that in the country, we've got quite a few PCR test kits for the open platforms. Um, so, so we've got over half a million. We've made sure that we we, we try to stock up on that. And the problem isn't with those, those PCR test kits for the open platforms, uh, nor is it for the low throughput machines as the, the Abbott M2000. Uh, uh, I've already stated that where the problem comes in is we, on a weekly basis, we get uh, 10,000 gene expert kits and 10,000 Roche Cobus kits. That's what we should be getting a day, but that's what we're getting per week. And this is where uh, our problem lies because that's where the, the test kits are required. Uh, the second problem lies with regard to the extraction kits for the open platform. So I've shown you that we've got over a half a million uh, tests for the open platform, but the limiting factor is how, uh, how many extraction kits we have in order to extract those viruses. And, and uh, you can see that again, on a weekly basis, we're getting about 15,000 uh, of those extraction kits. Um, and, and, and again, that's where the, the, uh, the, our problems and challenges lie. Uh, but I will also tell you some of the innovative ways that we are trying to overcome these problems. Um, this just gives you a, 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 an example of the unprocessed uh, specimens per province. And um, the, 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 you can see that uh, I'll, I'll discuss some of the strategies that we, we're trying to reduce the unprocessed specimens in uh, and prioritizing certain provinces. Uh, and uh, you know, as I've stated before, is when you put these figures up, then uh, the, you know, someone will say, no, no, but we've got a bigger backlog than this province. And uh, you know, I just want to, 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 to say that uh, some of these figures also uh, the, the, I've given you the definition of what would be a backlog. So if it falls within your particular turnaround time of 48 to 72 hours, those, those numbers may not be included. But as, as I've also indicated, this slide also indicates that the, the numbers do change all the time because as you, you, you process uh, samples, you're also then getting in a number of samples uh, but again, the principle is to say, this is what we, 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 we're facing with regard to unprocessed specimens, and we're doing our best to make sure that, that, that those numbers get reduced uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so, so 
how are we looking at the management of those unprocessed specimens? So uh, we, we, we have, together with the Department of Health, have looked at a targeted testing strategy. I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail. I think there is going to be a presentation with regard to that. Prof. Abdul Karim did speak to it. Um, the, but we, we, we ha have looked at prioritization of different test categories. And the, the, the categories that, that is prioritized are the in-hospital tests, patients under investigation, the contacts and critical care workers. Uh, we've issued an advisory to our laboratories to color code the testing samples based on those priorities. So we are able to process that as, as quickly as possible. And I, I need to assure everyone that the, the uh, uh, inpatients uh, and, and the patients under investigation, uh, that we uh, make sure that we try to get those tests done within the, the specified turnaround time. I know that there were hiccups, but uh, we, we uh, right now the, the, this we're working on making sure that all of that gets cleared. Our biggest backlog of unprocessed specimen lies with the community screening and, and, and testing. Uh, the other priority patients uh, have been prioritized. Um, we're also monitoring the, the positivity, the, uh, the rate of positivity in the provinces, and, and we're prioritizing our resources to the high positivity hotspots. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details here, because uh, I think Prof. Uh, Abdul Karim has shown a lot of graphs, but this is just to indicate to you uh, we've grouped together the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape as uh, two of the areas with high positivity rates. We monitor it on a daily basis to look at the number of positive cases we get uh, in, in, in the, the different provinces. Here you can see the Western Cape, how high it is, and the Eastern Cape is, is the second uh, challenge. Uh, Gauteng and, and KwaZulu-Natal are the other two group, uh, and you'd find here that the, uh, whilst there are a number of positive cases, the, the positivity rate is fairly stable, of between one, one to, to, to two percent. In the other provinces of, of in Pumalanga, Limpopo, uh, and, and, and Northwest and the Northern Cape, we go for days, as you can see on, on the graph, where there's no positive cases at, at all. And, and then we will get some positive cases, but the positivity rates in those provinces is below 1%. So you'll see also in the Free State, Free State had a problem, and this is sorry, just for the month of May. Free State had a problem with the, the different incidents, but we've been closely monitoring it and, and the number of positive cases. This is just in the NHLS uh, uh, samples. Uh, there there is, has been zero for a number of days and the same in the Northern Cape. Um, Part of what we are doing with regard to the, to the unprocessed specimens, the, the Minister of Health has requested us to prioritize the Western Cape because of its high positivity rate and, and containing the epidemic in the Western Cape uh, is going to be extremely important, not just for the Western Cape, but for the whole country. Uh, so for that reason, we've, uh, we've started looking at our high throughput test kits and we have prioritized the Western Cape uh, to get the major part of that. So this week, uh, we, we took about 8,000 of our 10,000 gene expert kits and sent it to the Western Cape. By the end of this week, they would have, uh, Western Cape would have received another 10,000 high throughput kits, both gene expert and corpus. Uh, and what we, what our intention with that is to just try to reduce the backlog uh, to the Western Cape so that we don't have any backlog, uh, but, Importantly, it's to identify the positive cases in order to be able to contain the ep epidemic. Over and above that, we've prioritized the Western Cape for new e equipment uh, that has been allocated. Uh, we, the Western Cape, for, uh, when, when it started off, did not have a COBUS uh, 6800. Uh, we procured one for the Western Cape, sent it through to the, uh, uh, to, to the Greenpoint Laboratory. We've uh, procured three additional extractors because of the difficulty that they've had in extraction. Uh, we've bought additional PCR machines uh, for the laboratories. And to the extent now that uh, our laboratories don't have 
enough space to take more machines, but we are finding solutions uh, with regard to that. And we've opened up the Greenpoint Laboratory, which has been capacitated as an additional testing site. It's become one of our very high throughput uh, laboratories with the number of tests that it's doing. But the other province that has been prioritized is the Eastern Cape, um, but we also have a plan in, in place to eradicate the backlogs in provinces that are not as effect, uh, affected, for example, the Free State. Uh, by the end of, of uh, uh, next week, uh, the Free State uh, won't have a backlog, uh, and we'll be systematically doing that with, with all of the other provinces. Uh, we've improved uh, workflow through our, through our uh, uh, laboratories. Uh, we've now using the innovative methods of uh, uh, of manual extractions, which including heat activation and, and lysis. Um, and this has been done together in, in cooperation, collaboration with the private sector, where we've been exchanging ideas as to what do we do uh, where we've got a shortage of extraction kits. And uh, I, I also need to point out that the, the, the problem with the, uh, the shortages of kits is not just uh, an NHLS problem, it affects the private sector as well. So we're very closely collaborating on uh, a number of innovative ways uh, in, in, in order to uh, reduce the problems that we have. We've also uh, engaged the academic research laboratories uh, and we're working closely with them to also look at how we would be able to uh, utilize the, the, their spare capacity, their capacity as part of our uh, search uh, program. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful to the Department of Agriculture and Land Reform and Rural Development, uh, where Minister Dediza and Minister Mkise um, facilitated uh, seven uh, extraction machines as well as 38 mobile uh, 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 units that we will be able to use in, in our field work. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through this. Uh, so one, one of the problems that we've had is that we normally try to standardize our equipment between laboratories. But having done that, we've, we, we discovered that in a situation uh, like the pandemic that we are facing, Having single suppliers tends to create a problem because if that supplier can't supply us with test kits, we just have a complete bottleneck and we can't proceed. So what we've done now is we've diversified the suppliers so that if we one supplier doesn't have a test kit, we, we go to another supplier and, and we, 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 we try and that. Uh, and so what we've done is we've bought, uh, we've ordered some time back uh, new equipment but the lead time has been long, long, but this is the new equipment that will be, that's currently getting installed and the Kingfisher uh, and, and uh, uh, Hamilton's will be installed in June. We've also bought a number of uh, new PCR instruments for amplification, uh, because the, again, our strategy is to say, if we improve on our extraction, let's also improve on the, the amplification uh, with new machines. So. So that has also been done. Uh, we've also managed to procure more gene expert infinities just to make sure that, uh, that the, the, our TB program also doesn't get affected. We'll be able to continue making sure that we can conduct our TB tests with the new machines. So, so in conclusion, uh, I just want to just, we, we have upscaled our capacity uh, in, within a very short space of, of time. Uh, but we're very much aware of the fact that whilst we've upscaled that capacity, uh, the problem that we're sitting with the unprocessed uh, uh, specimens has to be sorted out. And we committed to making sure uh, that we do sort those, those uh, uh, unprocessed specimens out. Uh, and as you can see, we've been increasing our outputs to, uh, to reduce the backlog. Uh, and, and we remain committed to delivering uh, quality testing uh, and we'll provide uh, you know, the, the, all the support that we can for the targeted testing strategy. So thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, the CEO of the National Health Laboratory Secretary. May I request uh, Dr. Tumi 
Mumete Mukukuteka, who is the CEO of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority, just to give us a sense in uh, five minutes what they have done to license under emergency and under routine processes uh, the various pro, uh, products that might be useful for purposes of uh, uh, increasing our capacity. And so uh, if we just take us through briefly. After that, I'm gonna ask that uh, uh, Dr. Natalie um, Mayet or Kerrigan McCarthy, just for about two minutes or so, whoever is available uh, to take us through the issue of unallocated, uh, just how we deal with it and how that uh, 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 come about and then we can then move from there. We we'll just make it very brief, uh, Dr. Tumi, please. Thank you, Minister. Can you hear me? Yes, yes you, can. you can. Please proceed. Good. Thank you very much. So I'll be giving a presentation from SAPRA, which is the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. This presentation focuses only on diagnostic tests. We also regulate uh, medicines um, as well as other health products. So just an overview, um, you know, since the uh, pandemic, we have received a total of 700 and, I mean, 71 applications for molecular tests. So that is the PCR that uh, Dr. Chetty referred to earlier. We have approved 23 of those for use. In addition, we have received 164 applications for serological tests. So these are the antibody tests. So this 164 includes both those that are point of care serological tests, as well as laboratory based serological tests. To date, we have um, recommended 20 of these to be validated through the National Health Laboratory Services. Of these 20, one of the serological point of care tests has been authorized for secondary validation. And the reason why we're doing the secondary validation is that many of you would be aware that a lot of these tests have very varied performance. You may have seen earlier during the pandemic, we had countries such as Spain, such as the US, as well as the, U the UK, recalling some of these tests because at this point they have this varied performance. And so it is imperative for us as a regulator to ensure that um, the tests that we approve at least give us performance that gives us comfort in that we're not going to sit with a high proportion of false negatives and false positive tests. And then lastly on the slide, we have three lab-based serological tests that again, we have authorized for validation by the NHLS. What we typically do when tests are submitted to South Africa, if these are recommended, if, I, if these are registered, with the regulators where we apply what we call reliance. These we automatically approved. However, with the pandemic, we've seen that there's been a number of developers that are not necessarily registering their tests in, in these countries where we have reliance mechanisms. And again, that's why we need to put in place these validations to ensure that as a country and as a regulator, we are satisfied with their performance. I thought I'll also touch on the process that we follow so that uh, you know, the listeners as well as industry can understand how it is that we take, um, we get these products to a point where we validate them. So if the products are imported, they submit their license to SAPRA together with their technical dossier. If they meet the recommendations of SAPRA in terms of our specifications, we then send them for secondary validation at a lab that we will communicate to them. And in this case, it's largely been the NHLS. If they pass um, the presentation by the, the, the if they pass the validation um, and they meet the criteria, as we have set forth, um, when the tests are uh, evaluated by the NHLS, they will then get a section 21 license that is issued and we will authorize their kids for a very specific use that we will determine and communicate to the applicant. In the event that uh, there is a local developer, and we're seeing a number of these, and we've actually had a workshop with them that was facilitated by the Department of Science and Innovation, where we communicated the process that we follow. So for local um, innovators and, and manufacturers, 
what they start doing is that once they've got their kids ready, they will then send them first for the primary evaluate validation by the NICD. Once they have then that data, they will then submit that to SAPRA. We will evaluate that data. And if they then meet the criteria, they will then be uh, authorized again in section 21 with a very specific indication of the use. So we're very much cognizant of the need to support locally developed tests. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this slide, but it's just to give you know, the country a sense of the numbers that we're dealing with as a regulator. Um, as I mentioned, we've received about 164 applications of serological tests. And there's very clear process steps that need to be followed. And while we have this platform, I'll also like to make a request to industry that when we send you requests and we require information and feedback from you on queries, we need you to respond timelessly because what we are also seeing as indicated here is that there are delays that we're encountering because this, the applicants are not supplying the information in the required time. And the numbers that I've indicated here is what I've shared with you earlier. Typically, this process of registering uh, medical devices takes up right, anything between three to six months. However, being cognizant of the pandemic and the need for us to, to, to respond with speed in support of the labs, we've accelerated our processes. We've even published how we, we, we go about these processes in that it takes us plus minus 18 days to evaluate serological tests and about four or five days to evaluate the PCR tests. So just to end off, um, this is a list of the PCR tests that we have approved. And this list is also available on our website. As soon as we've got serological tests that have been fully validated, they meet our criteria, we will also publish those on our website. Minister, I'd like to end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pumi. Uh, to me, Simete Makukoteka, uh, the CEO of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. I am fully aware that uh, that whole team, the board, the staff have been working very hard 24 hours over weekends to try and fast track this one in response to our call for uh, emergency approval to assist us to be able to cope with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So I want to say thank you very much for that presentation. Um, let me ask now uh, Dr. Natalie Mayet, uh, if you could just for about two, three minutes just to talk about what are the issues that create the uh, unallocated backlog and uh, what will the uh, what are some of the uh, uh, back office work they do in trying to uh, you know ensure that these are put onto stream. Just a two, three minutes uh, brief comment. Dr. Mayet, are you around? Okay. Uh, she is yeah. on. Yeah, okay. Let me see if uh, someone else from the Dr. Kerrigan McCarthy, you might also comment on that. You will probably come back <clears throat> on another comment later, but you can just deal with that aspect. Any comments briefly? So thank you, Minister, for the opportunity to respond to this question. Um, so every day, the National Institute of Communicable Diseases has a team of epidemiologists who together um, with the um, IT department um, of the NICD, uh, review the data coming into our central data warehouse um, in order to uh, provide uh, your office with the daily statistics. So the process um, includes um, a review of uh, the new cases that have arrived during the day from both the uh, public and the private sector. Um, we have a cutoff time of 12 o'clock uh, the previous night, um, and we include all the cases that have arrived for that previous 24 hours. Um, we then review the available information that we have, and sometimes when specimens are not uh, uh, the specimen request form is not completely uh, filled in by the requesting doctor, there is missing data and we are then unable to allocate uh, that particular result to a province. However, uh, our team works uh, with the provinces to complete this data and to make sure that the uh, specimen can be allocated um, in due course. 
Um, that's from my side. I see uh, Dr. Mayet is um, on the call, um, and perhaps she'd like to add something to that. Over. Dr. Mayet. Good evening, Minister, and good evening to the members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee and to viewers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirikan has outlined the, the process. I just need to, um, you know, to, uh, to highlight that um, COVID-19 is a notifiable medical condition. And it has been um, in the regulations since 2017 as a respiratory disease caused by a novel respiratory pathogen. And why I highlight that, Minister, is because this is required to be reported within 24 hours by all healthcare practitioners who are seeing a patient with a notifiable medical condition, by all laboratories in the public and the private sector, and by all our medical aid administrators. And this provides the framework for us collecting this data and pulling this data through from the private sector and the public sector, laboratory data systems, and we utilize and have a cutoff time at 12 o'clock every night, and um, then start processing that data from 4 a.m. So as uh, Dr. Kerikan has indicated, a team of epidemiologists, and we acknowledge the work that they do, process all of these tests from the NHLS system and from the private sector and allocate them to a province. Now there's a lot of complexity in that process because you may have a driver who works in the Eastern Cape and travels to the Western Cape, gets tested in the Western Cape, but resides in the Eastern Cape. He needs to be allocated accordingly. You may have somebody who resides in Pumalanga who goes to Pretoria for a test. So we cannot regard that positive test of that individual in, uh, as a Gauteng case, but as a Pumalanga case. So that happens on a daily basis in terms of apportioning and allocating tests to individuals. The NHLS has also collects test data. So that means one individual could have a number of tests in fact, we have one person in our database who's tested 15 times. The 13 tests have tested positive, one test was indeterminate, and the last test was negative. Now, we cannot count this person as 15 people. We have to count him as one person tested 15 times. So that's the filtration and the sifting process that the teams do on a daily basis. And then we also confirm if there's missing data, if there's sometimes an individual may write their address as the person who's responsible for payment. And if it's a student, often the person who's responsible for payment lives in a different province. So we have to filter all of these, clean up this data. And so when we present the case data um, on a daily basis of the positive number of cases, um, we are, we um, aligned with our provinces to make sure that indeed they are allocated appropriately and correctly. Um, and that's the process. And I would like to thank and acknowledge the teams who do this um, starting at 4 a.m. Um, in terms of closing all this data. So thank you, Minister, for giving us the opportunity. I would encourage all our healthcare professionals uh, to continue to notify this as a disease because that certainly will give us the insight into the determination of how this um, epidemic unfolds. Oh, fine. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mayat, <clears throat> Dr. and Dr. Kirgan Rakati, for that explanation. I think it's a very important explanation because every now and again we have had complaints from the media, from Twitter, people asking why aren't we getting these things at 8 o'clock in the morning every day? Uh, they ask why aren't we getting them uh, you know, at 12 o'clock and so on. At least if everyone would appreciate that there's a lot of disaggregation that has to be done behind uh, the, the scenes to be able to get a proper allocation. In some of the cases, the provinces have actually allocated people to go and sit in the laboratories to try and short, shorten the process of uh, identifying the individuals. 
There have been a few instances as well where the MECs had to call to say the numbers of patients that, <coughs> of positive cases that have been attributed to them are not as such, and so they're going to then uh, publicly announce that the numbers are not that. And so we have to uh, deal with that to say, yes, they have to announce that so that you can go and track the individual uh, because someone would be attributed and yet they are not found there. The other aspect that uh, should have, <coughs> we should also note is that in the early days, when lots of uh, non-South Africans who got tested and when we disaggregated the data, we realized that some of them were actually not even South African. So that's what sits in that pool of uh, backlog unallocated uh, uh, numbers, which uh, uh, is, uh, is an issue that really requires a lot of attention. This, uh, if there's an understanding of the work that has to be done behind the scenes, sometimes it takes until very late to be able to confirm some of those numbers. But thank you very much for, for that. Let me then ask uh, Dr. Anban Pile and Dr. Yogan Pile to just quickly give us a sense of readiness in terms of the beds and PPEs just briefly, and then we will then move uh, to take the number of questions that are coming through. If you could send them to the administrators, uh, we'll, they'll come to us and then we'll then uh, uh, send them to those who must respond to those questions. We've already uh, received a few of those questions already. And so, um, Dr. Uh, Anban Pile, the Acting Director General uh, in the Department, and Dr. Yogan Pile, the Deputy Director General, who can just take us through some of the uh, issues in terms of readiness. You've heard that uh, part of flattening the curve was to try and expand our health services so that they can cope with the new numbers that are coming through. So if we could just ask you to come through on that, uh, Dr. Anban Pile. Thank you, Minister. Um, if um, Sibu can just open the slide so I can... Uh... Uh, oh, just disable the, uh, the screen sharing so I can get in. Um, Dr. Pile, you may share your screen now. Okay, thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, yes. yes thank okay, you. We can see. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go through the uh, hospitalizations. Um, so, so this slide gives you a sense about the uh, number of cases, the recoveries, as well as the deaths. The cases is the cumulative number of people that have been tested positive uh, across the country in the various provinces. That's reflected in the green bar. Um, the blue bar refers to the recoveries, those that have been infected and have recovered. And the, um, the orange bar uh, refers to the number of deaths. You can see that uh, uh, the Western Cape has the highest number of uh, cases, positive cases. There's a significant number of recoveries as well. Uh, and there's, uh, there's uh, 406 deaths in the Western Cape, which is the highest. Mm -hmm. So the number of active cases, which is the burden of disease at any point in time, is the uh, uh, total number of cases minus the recoveries as well as the deaths. You can see across the rest of the provinces, largely this is fairly low, except uh, the Western Cape where it's quite high. This second slide talks uh, about the hospitalization data, and we're particularly focusing here on high care ICU and ventilation. You can see that the, uh, the high care data is reflected in the uh, uh, yellow bar, the ICU data in the dark green uh, um, bar, and then the ventilation in the um, dark blue bar. Um, and what you can see as well here that the, the Western Cape has the highest number of patients that are in ICU, um, as well as those that are on ventilation and those requiring oxygen. Um, in the other provinces, such as KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng, as well as the Eastern Cape, we have uh, uh, many of them are hospitalized, but very few of them actually utilizing um, ICU or being on ventilation. So at this stage, uh, the demand for ventilation or ICU is fairly low, except obviously in the Western Cape, which is currently having a surge in the number of cases. In terms of quarantine beds, quarantine uh, are sites where those that uh, may be uh, infected are kept in order to, uh, to establish whether they're actually infected or not. And uh, these are the uh, number of beds that we have across the country. In total, we have 35,759 beds. 
not all of these beds are occupied and of these we have activated or utilized 36 percent of the beds across each of the provinces this is where where persons are unable to quarantine at home or south africans that are being repatriated are placed in quarantine sites across the country uh, clearly the, the the province with the most quarantines beds that are uh, activated is Gauteng, uh, simply because most of the repatriation flights arrive in, in Gauteng, and so people are quarantined in Gauteng and then they move over to other provinces. And the Western Cape, uh, given the, the high burden of disease currently, uh, have um, a significant number of uh, beds that are activated as well. Uh, this is a, a slide uh, uh, indicating the amount of PPE that we have. We have implemented a system of what we call the stock visibility. It's an electronic system. So facilities uh, in the public health sector send us their stock levels. And this is uh, updated on a weekly basis. Uh, and the provinces with a high burden are monitored much closer. So the PP that we monitor are the masks, such as a surgical masks, N95, uh, FFP, et cetera, uh, gloves, gowns, uh, uh, aprons, uh, as well as sanitizers, boot covers, uh, digital thermometers, disinfectants, etc. Um, and you can see uh, across each of the provinces the, the quantity of stock that's available. So if you took, for example, masks, surgical masks, in the Western Cape they have over 9 million, um, and in the country we have 26 million, we clearly will move more stock uh, to, to provinces that have a high burden, such as uh, the Western Cape currently, and we anticipate as the burden uh, increases in other provinces, we will then move stock to those other provinces as well. So this, this system is intended to monitor the stock levels across provinces and uh, intervene where these uh, problems may arise. And then finally, just to say, give you a little bit of a sense about what our bed status looks like, uh, I think it's important to link this to the first slide that Professor Karim presented, because our objective is to try and reduce the height of the curve so we reduce the number of people that are requiring beds at any point in time so the health system can cope. On the uh, left-hand side of this table, you can see the total number of beds that we have. We also have this, uh, uh, separated this out into general beds and the critical care beds. And on the right-hand side, is, these are the beds for COVID-19 patients. We have the general beds that have been allocated for COVID-19. You can see in total, these are about 12,000 beds across each of the provinces. We have then the critical care beds that have been allocated. These are 2,309. And then additionally, we have the field hospital beds, which are 13,129 at this stage. So in total, we have about 27,467 beds that have been allocated for COVID. Uh, in response to the to the uh, potential surge in the number of cases that would come through. Thank you, Minister. We'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think it should also just be noted that uh, most of those uh, field beds, it takes a period of about two to three weeks uh, to uh, put in place. And so what we have uh, taken is an approach that says that when uh, we see the numbers are indicating that those beds may be undermined uh, uh, or swamped, we then uh, will be asking the provinces to increase the beds. That means we have about a, a month or so to be able to adjust to the new numbers that will be required. So there's a, a, a kind of a alertness to look at how we can actually move the numbers up as the, uh, the, the trend of the pandemic is actually showing itself. The, some of the modelers who put up the earlier models actually had a very different approach. They thought the first uh, surge is going to come into uh, Houghton, followed by Guazul Natal. So it's very, very important for us to say, once you observe what the models uh, have been showing, but we are watching numbers on the ground. What is our data telling us? Now, in this case, as what you have seen from uh, Professor Tukari, the data is indicating that uh, the numbers and the, the, the time uh, on the Western Cape is uh, moving faster, and therefore there has to be you know, an equal response in supplies of uh, additional beds of PPEs, as well as also on human resources. And uh, all of this is all in response 
to what the uh, emerging pattern of the pandemic is showing. So um, I, I think at this point we should uh, then take some uh, comments and questions. But whilst we are going to be requesting for comments to be coming through, would I then ask uh, if Dr. Kalua, the the, uh, the uh, current representative of uh, WHO would maybe just have a word or two, just a minute or two, just to have some uh, comments to make. And in the meantime, we're going to be uh, announcing the, the questions and the responses there too. Thank you very much. Please, uh, Dr. Kalua, if you could uh, just uh, come on board a uh, couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and thanks very much uh, to all colleagues. Uh, just a few comments, Minister. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that from the perspective of WHO and also uh, observing what is going on uh, within the, particularly the Africa region, is that the response in South Africa uh, was rapid, was decisive, and was very much based and informed by data. And that is a very important point uh, that a number of countries from the region will have to learn from. If we go on to talk about the, the lockdown that was put in place and indeed bought a lot of time and allowed uh, for a number of measures to be put in place, the easing of the lockdown that is ongoing has been followed very much by the data. And that particular process of easing down is in line with what WHO has advised that we should have, countries should have gradual easing of lockdown. So the moving in South Africa from stage five to four to three, and subsequently to other steps, uh, other stages forward is very much in line with what WHO has advised. And the extent to which the data is being used to look at hotspots and to have a differentiated approach is something that countries in Africa will have to learn from. Because indeed South Africa is having to ease down uh, the lockdown at a time uh, when cases overall are increasing. And that would also be a case in a number of countries within the region. So the lessons that we learn from uh, South Africa will be critical for informing other countries on how they should manage their response and also manage the lockdown. But as, as has been pointed by uh, Professor Karim, the important point is the involvement and engagement of the, uh, the public in that each individual has to take into account and implement and, and, and adopt the various public health measures that are in place now, uh, the hand washing, the sanitizing, the cough etiquette, the social distancing. And if each and every individuals begin to adopt this and complement the effort that government and other stakeholders are doing, I think we'll move a, a long way in addressing this um, uh, uh, pandemic. So Honorable Minister, thanks very much. Just once again to, to say that if we can uh, document what we're doing in South Africa, it will be variable in informing other countries as they implement their own responses, as also they move towards easing their own lockdowns. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalua, <clears throat> for those very encouraging comments. And also thank you for all the support. If I may as well say that uh, we are very grateful that most of the uh, provinces have got technical support from your office and we want you to no, we appreciate all of that uh, uh, very important work. Uh, we've now been asked by media if uh, we could uh, start talking about the numbers for today. So we'll take now another two minutes just to deal with that issue. Uh, uh, what we do is we're going to just share the numbers as you'll see them on the, on the screen. At this point, uh, I think it's important to indicate that uh, uh, South Africa, uh, the latest uh, numbers, uh, cumulative cases are 29,240 with a new 1,837 cases in the last 24 hours. The national case fatality rate uh, is uh, at 611, at 2% uh, as of today, 29th of May. The numbers of recoveries 
I 15,093, which is 52%. <clears throat> you will also again see the numbers uh, in terms of the various provinces, the cumulative uh, cases uh, for the uh, different provinces, Eastern Cape. Uh,